Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More. And today in Tube Lab number 82, we're going to take a look at why tube labels don't always help. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. When you're trying to identify a tube, the label is not often very helpful, especially when that tube was made in a former Soviet state or behind the Iron Curtain, as we used to say. The reason for this is trade embargoes and tariffs were often in place on tubes manufactured in those countries. And to get around an embargo or tariff, importers often committed a wee bit of fraud. Now, that might sound like a really bad thing, but remember, by the late 70s, early 80s, Almost all the Western plants had closed, and that, that only left two plants in China, and nobody wanted those tubes, and the Eastern European plants. Most of those were in Soviet-controlled states. So if you wanted a quality tube from the GDR, or East Germany, as everyone in the West used to call them, a wee bit of label flimflamory or ducks and drakes was required. Let's take a look and see what I mean. Now, what got me going on this label thing is that my, my partner Charles got lucky and he found enough new old stock, NOS, new in the box, NIB, RFTs, one of my favorite EL34s. Um, he found enough of them to make two close match quads. So that I was really thrilled about that. And he's one lucky son of a gun. Um, when, when he was younger, we used to call him the ace man, because if the high card in a game was the ace, <laughs> guess who had them all? <laughs> Anyways, I don't know if it's luck or just diligence. I think he works really hard at finding good tubes. He's been a great asset to the business since he joined. Anyways, um, let's take a look at what the heck I'm talking about. Okay, so... Spoiler alert, all these tubes are the same tube. They're all RFTs. They're all made in the former East Germany, and they're essentially identical, except that they're all labeled differently. So let's look at this. Here's one. These are all original boxes. So this one says Sylvania, Great Britain. AEG was... Um, the equivalent to General Electric in the U.S. So this is German General Electric, is roughly how it translates. They don't put anything on the box except DL34. Um, we've got International here, GTE Sylvania. What do they put? Well, this is interesting. The label says West Germany, but it's been re somebody made a note East Germany. Well. Whoever made the little pen note, of course, was right. Here's a beautiful Siemens box. Um, what do they say? They don't say anything. They just say it's a 6CA7, which, of course, is the um, which is the U.S. designation or equivalent number for the EL34, which is the original European number. And nobody uses 6CA7 anymore. EL34 is pretty much universal across the board. doesn't matter where in the world you lived. Nobody looks for a CA7 anymore. Okay, and it makes sense too, because of course the source of EL34s was, was Phillips and Mullard and other manufacturers that picked up the man, picked up the tube in Europe. That's where the vast majority of them were made. So let's just start on the right and um, have a look at them. So this one is reasonably well labeled. It says International Sylvania, made in the GDR. So that's a correct label. Now, to identify the any tube, I would suggest, and we're going to look at all the labels quickly, but I would suggest you look at the properties visually of the tube and not the labels as your prime identifier. The labels sometimes will help steer you in the right direction. But what the tube physically looks like will be the um, the key to making sure you've got what you think you've got. So all of these tubes had a little dimple in the top. 
and they've all got a an elevated bit of plastic. Let's see if I get it focused on the up close here for you. See that little bit of a bump up in the plastic at the where the pin meets the base. All the modern version of the RFTs had that bump. Now there is an early early version, the very made in the first years. You don't see too many of them around anymore. Um, and they had a, a very large matte um, plastic base that was smooth on the bottom. And I think I've seen a couple of those over the years, and that's it. Okay, next. Another Sylvania International. And here it says, you can, it's hard to read, but it says UK. Not. <laughs> Here's Westinghouse. Here's a good one. Made in Holland. <laughs> Not. <laughs> um, here's another one, Slovenia. And it just tells us 6CA7 or EO34. So at least there's no flim flammery on that one. There's another Slovenia. And it says Great Britain on this one. Not. <laughs> AEG, that was German General Electric, EO34. And they don't say anything else. What else have we got? We've got a Siemens, made in Germany. Well, it's sort of true, isn't it? Um, and up last, we've got an original label RFT, the real thing, the real label. And um, let's take a look at it. Of course, it's got the bumps on the plastic base. It's got the dimple and it's got four large rivets on each side and the two um, vent holes or rectangles punched in the plate and they all had fairly large halo getters singles and a pair of shields on each side um, and the reason why I don't stress the rivets and the punch outs on the plate is because that's a very common detail that you'll see all over the place but you won't see the bumps and you won't see the dimples on very many tubes there are other tubes other than the RFT that'll have a dimple top but nobody else has the little bump where the pin goes into the base so if you combine this 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 and this and you check off every box then you know you've got a real RFT. So a couple of quads are in the store. A um, couple of new old stock quads. I'm going to warn you, um, high demand, new in the box, power tubes are, have become very expensive. The wholesale price, um, it, it basically doubled. Um, and the getting enough of them together to make one quad is hard these days. Um, two quads. I can remember a few years ago I got in a whole bunch of RFTs and they were all from the same box. They were reasonably priced. I was able to sell them for a very reasonable amount of money. Those days are gone. <laughs> That's never going to happen again. Um, you know, the inventory of high quality, uh, new old stock, new in the box, high demand tubes is just, it's just disappearing. So anyways, what is happening over at Melatone Kits. Well, it's been a really intense two weeks because, let me just clear the decks here and I'll go get something for you to have a look at, because Charles and I have been busy filming the build series. It's finished, which means that kit build number one of the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 preamp is finished. Let me go grab it. Here it is. Let me back out a little bit. Now I always build, of course I build the prototypes, but I always build kit number one um, to make sure that the builders of the kit actually have, um, actually get to watch the exact kit that they're going to build being built in front of them. That's, I mean, that's how we do it. That's your build manual, basically. I'm just fooling around over here trying to get a piece of paper in the right spot. Um, so that makes it fairly easy to um, 
the only problem with black, gray does, uh, silver doesn't show dust, but black, man, you gotta, I'm always in there cleaning things up. <laughs> Anyways, a quick wipe with a cotton rag. So, uh, we got our first uh, kit builder finished. In fact, he finished ahead of the build series, and uh, he's been nicknamed Speedy. <laughs> Uh, I think he did a great job, though. He's really focused. He's he's into audio. He's one of my best customers, and he's seriously into it. So he wanted to do it right, but he was in a hurry to hear it. So, anyways, we already, even though the test builder is still diligently working away, and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Um, I've already got a review in the store for the Universal Pre. So let's read it. I mean, you know, I love my reviews. This is how. Um, you build a business and how you sell tubes and amps is uh, good reviews. So he says, I couldn't stop listening as soon as I fired it up. I had a wonderful time building the Universal preamp and learned a lot. It was so fun, I couldn't stop and finished ahead of Jim's construction build. I had a couple of hiccups, but they were of my own making and easy to fix because of the thoughtful layout. My hiccups were also very instructional. A wonderful experience. Well, I think that's saying a bit much, but he's a good guy, though. So I think he rolls with the punch, or rolls with the problem would be a better way of saying it. The sound is where you really get paid off for your labors. All terms you've heard apply here. Soundstage, separation, warm yet focused. It's all here, and you build it yourself. Well, I can't recommend this kit highly enough. Thanks, guys. So, I mean, I can't make reviews like this up. <laughs> They're, they are wonderful. And I'd like to thank um, the first test builder for all of his help. Test builders are essential. Let me back out a bit again. They, um, they point out shortages in materials in the first kits that go out which is one of the prime reasons why I build, because I want to see if we're short something. Um, and they also help with difficult areas. So when a test builder finds a problem, let me flip it over so you can see. Now you may have noticed I got one of my favorite um, 6S and 7s plugged in. We should look at it. This is actually a 12S and 7. And the universal preamp will take almost, well, it will take any 6 or 12 SN7 tube ever made. This is the early tongue saw Mousier GT. So you can't plug this sucker into just any amp or preamp. But you can put it in the universal. And that's That was the main reason why I started working on the universal design. And eventually I added another reason, which was not only do I want to play 6 and 12 SN7 tubes, but I also wanted to be able to play the lower spec um, GT version safely without without blowing them up. Well, you don't blow them up. What you do is you make them noisy. Uh, you overload them and you make them permanently noisy. So anyways, these 12 SN7s are reasonably, they're still expensive tubes, but they're in, compared to what a 6 SN7 mouse ear would cost, they are cheap. <laughs> And you can't get the 6SN7 mouse ear. Um, I had some, oh, I don't know, a long time ago. And my, my goodness, um, as soon as people found them, they were gone. <laughs> so here's the finished build. This is the standard topology that we use for all of our preamps. It's a dual mono design. This is the actual layout that we use for the preamps in which we have the right channel is over here, the power supply and the preamp board. And on the left channel, we have another power supply. Remember, it's two preamps inside one chassis. And that gives you a fabulous stereo separation and it gives you a great sound stage just as a foundation to good sound. Um, so we have another channel over here. And you'll, you'll notice that the layout, even though it looks a little bit busy, is organized. Things like the high voltage wires come flying in and stay away from the circuit. The low voltage input wires are all 
laid out in such a way that they're nowhere near any noise and all of the noisy components, the power supply boards and uh, transformer and chokes, etc., are all way back here in the rear. And of course that's all by design. Anyways, the production version of this, let me flip this over, is underway. The parts actually are in stock. All we need to do is to get the top plate CNC manufactured and then we'll start putting quantities in the store so that we can sell more than, you know, I think we sold uh, four or five to test builders. And we'll be, we'll be putting 10 and 20 in the store at a time uh, in the future. At least 10 to start with. Okay, well, what came in this week? Well, lots. I mean, literally thousands of tubes have been coming in. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to clear the decks here, and I'm going to show you some of the highlights. A lot of the tubes that are coming in are for future kit amps. Um, so we won't talk about those tubes just yet because there's nothing to play them in. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, let's get some over here. Oh, I hear somebody saying, are those red bases? Uh, yep, yep they are. In fact, I've got some original boxes to show you. Okay. Let's start over here. This is actually the oldest tube by far. This is the E1148. And this is the driver stage tube for the little Yuri monoblock. And the uh, common name for this tube, the original name, is the CV6 or common valve 6. And look at this. This is a Hytron. Whoa, everybody says. Anybody that knows tubes knows that Hytron was a great manufacturer. They were located in Massachusetts and eventually they got bought out. But Hytron, original Hytron tubes are really sought after. They made high quality stuff and it's got its military designator number VT232 on there. Where and it's a double cap, top cap triode. And the triode is actually mounted sideways. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't that weird? And that was to get the connections as close to the plate and grid <coughs> connections as possible to keep, it, keep the noise down. Because this was originally a radar tube. So noise uh, was really critical with these tubes, or low noise. Uh, but it, it may not be the perfect driver tube for the URI electrically, but it's good enough electrically. But what makes this thing stand out is that it sounds amazing. It is just a really wonderful sounding triode. So, finding tubes like this from... Do we have a year? Let me see. No, we don't have a year on the box. So we don't know for sure, and I can't read the Hytron date code, if that is a date code, it might just be a manufacturing code. But most likely these are from the 1940s, maybe the early 50s. Um, that's the heyday of this tube. Okay, let's just put that aside. Oh, and I wanted to mention something. All of the various driver tubes for the Yuri sound amazing. They all sound great. This, though, is one of my favorite. I... I'm not sure what the difference is, and someday maybe um, we'll do a big review on them if we've sold a lot of the Uris. Um, but, and I've tried, I've tried them all. I've quite a, there's, because the radar was such a huge thing back in the Second World War, every country and had at least one good manufacturer making these tubes. So there's UK Mullards, there's a um, U.S. version, there's a Soviet version, you name it. Everybody and his brother was making a version of this tube. Um, so there's lots to choose from to roll. And they're reasonably priced. Okay, now this is one of my favorite 6SN7s. Let's zoom in a little bit. The Tungsol Tallboy 6SN7 GTB. I don't know if you can see that or not. The labels on top often faded. 
most tubes, the top label didn't hold. Um, and these are just great all-around 6SN7s, but they've got good detail. Now look what we've got here. The problem with the tongue saws, besides the fact that they cost a fortune, um, is that the manufacturing numbers were lower than virtually any other 6SN7. So there weren't that many around to start with. And to top that, to make that even worse, they, they didn't tend to last well in, in service in some applications. I don't know where people were plugging them in, but a lot of the used ones are worn out basically. And the new old stock ones test about 10% lower than a normal 6SN7. So matching up pairs is not easy. It's one of the reasons why they're so expensive. Um, that and of course the high failure rate. Now once they get sorted electrically, and once the listening test, once they pass the listening test, they seem to be fine. So I think they're a good tube, um, and they sound amazing, of course. So what do we got here? Well, we've got a used one, and we've got a new one. Now, why are they paired up, and why in the heck um, are they going to be sold as a used pair? Well, it's so hard to find matches. I I can't sell a a used and a new old stock tube as a new old stock pair. It's a lot of money for a new old stock pair. So what I do is I somebody gets a deal and they, they end up with a used and a new tube testing identically. Um, and this is probably fairly close to a new old stock tube. And they just go out the door that way. That's just company policy. <laughs> um, so let's just put those over there. Now I saved the best to last as always. These are RCA red bases, and anybody that knows anything about tubes knows that this is one of the um, highest sought at, most sought after tube ever made. RCA came out with what they called a, um, a premium line of low noise tubes. They gave them red bases, um, and let's look at some boxes here. Here's an original box. 50, they, th now this is the 6SL7 equivalent, and their number was 5691. The 6SN7 equivalent is 5692, so <laughs> you try to remember that. I don't. Here's a brand new box. That one was new as well, but it's it's been in the sun. You can see it's faded a little bit. It's another brand new box. Nothing very exciting. Let's look at this box. Now, a lot of these tubes were mil-spec tubes, or a better way of saying it is the specifications were mil-spec, and they were used for uh, military industrial applications, and this GE box, labeled 5691, really shows you how they packed military tubes. They got a, the packing would have been a special specification and what they did was they took this kind of, I think this is oakum. Um, it's a kind of a natural uh, fabric, I think. And I've already taken the tube out. It actually says it's an RCA tube right on the label. But it, it, of course, the, there's a GE service um, sheet in here in case there's a problem with the tube. But Quite often, not always, but quite often, a mill spec tube or a military order lot of tubes would come packed uh, in a superior method to a domestic tube. You know, that was meant just to go into a radio or a TV, etc. And that's that's really good solid confirmation when you see a box like that. Look, look at the size difference. So what makes these things so good? Well. Low noise. It's a high gain tube. The 6SL7 is a is a um, is the high gain tube before the 12AX7 became popular. Before it was invented. Before it was started getting manufactured in quantity. This was the go-to tube for high gain. It had a gain of 70, whereas the later 12AX7 had a gain of 100. Now those are nominal gain factors. You never see that in a tube circuit. But that gets you, gives you an idea as to uh, 
what their relative gain was. To compare that, uh, 6SN7 only had a gain of 20. So that's quite a difference, 20 to 70. And look at the structure. You see how it's got a reinforcing rod. It's actually got a third mica on top. That is to reduce vibration and to act as a further shield. Um, it's a compact tube. You see how... If you, I don't have any regular 6SL7s on the bench, I don't think. No. Uh, but a regular 6SL7 is normally quite a bit taller. Uh, so you combine all those factors and then probably, I don't know for sure, but probably they did more rigorous testing in the factory to ensure they were on spec. And all of those things combined to make a great sounding low noise 6SL7. And because they uh, were expensive tubes when they were sold originally and there just weren't that many of them made compared to the regular 6SL7, they, they've been collector's items, high demand tubes for years. I can remember when I first saw one, I was just starting to uh, set up the business, set up the tube business, and I met in my kitchen with a seller, and he brought over the deal that we had made, a whole bunch of tubes, a whole bunch of 6L6s, I think. And he said, after we'd done the deal, he said, I've got one special tube you may be interested in. It's new in the box, and he had it all wrapped up carefully in a towel or something. And uh, he unwrapped it really carefully like it was a piece of gold or a gold nugget or, um, you know, a Fabergé egg or something like that. that there's a good, maybe that's not a good analogy. But anyways, you know what I mean. And uh, he named an outrageous price for it, and I thought, my God, do people pay that much for tubes? <laughs> now, this is a while ago. <laughs> anyways, I thought, what the heck, I'll give him the money. And it turned out, uh, you know, that what I thought was a big price back in the day was, you know, jump change these days. Anyways, so there's enough of these that came in. Charles found these as well, that there's two matched pairs of new old stock, new in the box, 5691s in the store. Um, okay, well, if you stay till the end, here are some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.